there's such exhilaration, there's such joy when we play on stage. Why did it take so long to see you again? 17 years. I've been, um, I've been asked why it took us so long to play again in Paris. And I think it's because the um, first thing that happens is we don't have an agent. The second thing is we don't have a real record label. We work with a small label. So we have no one promote shows. And this has been normal for us always. And then um, we probably weren't asked to play for the first few years. And then I had a daughter, and we didn't play for six years after that. And then about six years ago, we were asked to play here, and then we have to learn the songs. We can, oh, we can't be bothered to learn the songs. But this year, we did a couple of shows, so we roughly know the songs, and we were asked, and we said, yes, fine. So, because we're not professional group, there's a reason. Grosso modo, leurs artistes scéniques majoritairement dû au fait qu'ils soient toujours restés sur des labels indépendants. Et par ailleurs, il y a quelques années, ça ne se pas bêtise, il y a eu un enfant qui a mis fin à une résidence au Dirty Water Club de manière mensuelle, mais à Londres depuis quelques années. Et il y a trois ans, ils ont eu une offre pour jouer ici, ils ne connaissaient pas encore les morceaux, ils s'y sont remis progressivement et ils ont eu le thème noir. <laughs> He's gone already. Just do the show. What are we doing here at the tour? That will be naive. If anyone's even interested in Nearer the better. Just I came back no also by train. I didn't even hear your last question, so if you could repeat it. What I was asked before was why it took so long for us to play in Paris after 16 years, apparently. 17. 17 years old. And I said because we probably weren't asked for the first five or six years, and then we don't have an agent anyway, and we don't do stuff with agents, so nothing was offered that worked. And then we had a daughter nine years ago, and we didn't play for another six years. So really, we're not a professional group, so we don't have agents telling us what to do or where to go. I think we were asked to come here five, six years ago, and we were busy like um, doing other things, not with a group, because we weren't playing. Because I suppose playing music isn't much of a priority. So it's like, at the moment it fits in okay because our daughters, me and my wife Julie's in the group, our daughter's nine now, and we, because uh, we don't like taking her to rock and roll things anyway, because we don't really like the, uh, this is a bit different, yeah. 
but generally speaking, and she didn't want to come anyway today, so she stayed with um, she stayed with, me <coughs> with, uh, with uh, my son's mum. So that was the question, that was the answer. We can all go again. <laughs> and a bit of a kicky one. Um, MBE, members of the British Empire, I always wondered if it was um, like a pump to this very incongruous part of pop culture in Britain where the Beatles were decorated by the Queen. Oh, no, no. And all it was is that we were in a group called the MBEs, members of uh, musicians of the British Empire, because it fits with MBE, which is an award in England. And it was uh, probably my idea for it was, one, we were really still the Buff Midways, but Graham from the Prisoners and the Caesars who ended up playing bass with us, we, we were gonna, we really wanted to move on and do something else about Graham with Julie and not to upset him, we changed the name of the group to the MBEs. Um, and it was a bit of a joke name, but do you know a group called uh, KLF? Mm -hmm. uh, of course. Yeah, well, I'm friends with Bill Drummond is one of yeah. my uh, top 10 well, socialist heroes, oh, right. including well, you. Well, they're friends. Um, uh, um, we're we're friends with Jimmy, and Jimmy had done, um, I can't remember, he did something, he had some joke around the same idea. It was um, something, I can't remember what it was, but Jim had some joke around this idea, and I sort of like just developed it a bit. As a, so really it's just a silly name, so that you can call yourself members of the end of the years. And it, so, so it's got a little uh, KLF. Element to it. As because as, as, CTMF is also because we're because um, KLF is like uh, I'd never heard of KLF and I didn't know anything about the group, but I knew Jimmy and Bill Drummond used to speak to me sometimes, and I didn't know any of them were in groups or anything. And Bill Drummond used to talk to me about um, art and art management, ring me up and talk to this guy called Bill, and I'd never met him, and I've only met Bill once, but then. I worked with a friend who also works with Jimmy. Um, then my wife said, well, you should have a look on and look at KLF, which I thought was very funny, because I find that stuff amusing. And, it was, be and, was before they were in the charts? Or? Oh, no, way after. Yeah. This was a couple of years ago, because <laughs> I'd never heard of them. And uh, this was uh, maybe nine years ago or so. And, um, one of the ideas is KLF stands for um, Copyright Liberation, Liberation Front. Front. So CTMF is Copyright Termination Front. Fair yeah, because we uh, we also had this joke that uh, that Bill and Jimmy were playing in, playing uh, in the group because we did a couple of things with Jimmy. Bill Drummond actually released a record on creation called The Man, and it's. Probably the worst pathetic attempt for an Englishman to sound like Jonathan Richmond, but it never sold. I can find it on any any second hand store. Get it? Bill Drummond, the man. It was the guy from Canada trying to make Jonathan Richmond. Here's to you, audience. New question, please. What do you remember about your years in Sub Pop, Sub Pop Records? Not an awful lot. One of the things. All that happened was, is uh, we, the reason we were on Sub Pop Records was because um, Steve uh, Turner from Mudhoney, I found out that the reason that all of this, um, those uh, grunge groups knew us yeah. was because Steve Turner is a sort of, uh, 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 what do you call it, a geek. Plex Records, yeah. and he had come to it. He showed me these photographs he'd taken of the Mighty Caesars in a small club in London when he was 15. Because his father came to, his father worked in London or had a job in London. He travelled to London with his father and came came to see the Mighty Caesars when he was 15. And he showed us these photographs he'd taken. So I think he was a Caesars fan, and he must have introduced the songs to those people. And I think it's and to Mudhoney, and then um, uh, convinced Bruce Pavitt that they should 
release that stuff. And Sub Pop used to be a fanzine, which was um, Kelvin Johnson. Kelvin Johnson, yeah. yeah. Him and Bruce, I think, did. I found out all this retrospectively, and Kelvin was a big fan of ours. And um, that's why I think that's because he must have known that Beck guy, and that's why that Beck guy was a fan as well. So there's all these funny little machinations go on. And we were just, um, I wasn't interested in any of the sub pop music, and we just thought they were a bunch of, like, look like status quo, and we're doing sort of weird rock music. But Mudhoney liked us, and when we went up, they are, invited us to tour with them down the west coast. And they were very nice and friendly. The good thing about Mud Honey and that lot is they didn't care that we didn't think they were, well, I wasn't interested or like it. I like them, and I don't need to like the music. But you, you know, they're, they're pro probably a little bit old school where they don't need to be liked back. You know, I mean, I like them as people, and I, we appreciate them, we're friends, but you didn't have to pretend to like the music. Whereas when you've got a situation with groups like the garage groups with uh, Jack White and people, if you don't like the music, they get upset. Because they're fans of you and you're meant to be a fan back, but I am one of the world's worst fans. I mean, I, I just don't like much stuff and I'm not really interested in music much. And it's uh, like, it's a mistake to try and get me to sort of like things. I don't, I mean, I just liked some things from the 60s, then I liked some things from 76, and then I liked some things from the uh, blues period. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't really, uh, I'm not really relevant or somebody likes music. So, so the, the most modern band you quoted and liking were Buzzcocks? I, like buzz, I saw the Buzzcocks in 67. And I think that it's great, you know, I really like the original singer, and I really, I'd like the lad who took over as well. They're good pop group. The thing I like about music is, I suppose, pop element in it. If I listen to it, like the thing I like about rock and roll or um, psychedelia or punk rock is the what I call pop music part of it. Like I like Jimmy, pop, Jimi Hendrix. I don't like rock Jimi Hendrix. I don't like I don't like rock music basically. Unless it's got plenty of pop. Yeah, it is. It? Otherwise, I'd prefer to have nothing or maybe um, some classical music or something. Mm -hmm. I have a question. When are you going to play, uh, going to play next in Paris? I don't know. But it, everything comes down to invites with us because we don't have an agent. And really, it just depends if it fits in okay or we're... Um, the, this was a little easy because we'd uh, <coughs> we played. We've been asked to play in California for that last five years as well, as well as here. And then we agreed to do the California show because we'd learned the songs because the label we worked with in London had asked us to play a show in London. And then once we start sort of getting an idea of where the songs go, and it means that it sort of makes it a little easier. But we have a lot of problem playing shows because we use such weird equipment because we don't use standard sound mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know our idea is that well particularly my idea is that it should be like um, uh, have the feeling of live shows how they used to be not people mining or CD or filling an auditorium with a sort of like a impressive in a way it's like it's meant to be not impressive in the sense of you're not meant to be wowed, you're meant to be sort of like able to um, reach and touch the audience, you know like and the audience touch yeah. you so it's sort of like a, more of a, a more of a joy in it we don't really like big shows very much. I mean, this is a, I don't mind seated shows. This is a bit weird because everyone was good because they came into the middle a bit and got out of the seats, but because this is wide, it gets strange. Yeah, there's some distance. Yeah, and it, but it's not too bad because you're still there. We, haven't, we don't have the monitors mm. and we're always trying to, the problem is, is the very small shows, they can't afford to pay for you to come over and bring all the gear and make it work. So it's like getting that balance is important. 
because we don't really, I'm not really a fan of festivals, but festivals are the things that can pay for you to pay for everything so you can bring the equipment and do it. So getting that balance. My really you want, I think small clubs is the best one. Yeah. But this is pretty good, you know, it does the job. And I do like seated. It's just a job, but it's just a job. I mean, no, it does the job. Ah, okay. It, does, it, it does fits the bill. Yeah. For me, as a public, I mean, there is more distance than in a small, I uh, don't know, bar or yeah. something like that. Because you're above, yeah. and we have to look up, and yeah. there's yeah, but I mean, sharing. It, it, yeah, but the thing is, you can, if you, see, I see, the thing I like is if you see footage of MC5 playing in the late 60s or uh, Hendrix even playing in 67 mm -hmm. and it's not that different and you're here yeah. and you can stand there and the people watch and see what's going on and there's not the barrier here, there's not people stopping you being near. No, of course. Because what happens is, is you play, you play these other shows, they've got a barrier here, mm -hmm. no one's allowed near there, mm -hmm. then you've got a pile of yeah. fold back. Yeah. And then the sound is just total control from yeah, above, and the room is meant to be every corner full of the sound, sort of like, that is bullshit for me. Yeah. And, or, the, or the stadium, or the uh, big field where you can't, with the massive gap between the group. We were asked, like, um, when, the, when the garage music took off in the, uh, about 15 years ago, and people asked us, like, why we were, um, like, how we were similar to all the garage bands that were coming through. Mm. And I said, well, we're not similar at all because they all want to get into a stadium as quickly as possible. Whereas we want to close, we're always trying to close the gap. We're not trying, we're not trying to be anything. Mm. We don't want to be, um, we have no ambition, mm. you know. And, well, very limited ambition. It's not like, <laughs> our ambition uh -huh. is to, for the thing to sound how we want it to sound and do what we want to do not to have a bigger audience, you know. I mean, once you go past 400 people, it can get quite um, difficult, yeah. you know. 400, you can do an old-fashioned theater with 400 can work quite nicely. But once you start getting beyond that, start, you start getting this gap between you and yeah. what's happening. I think, anyway. Did you feel a gap tonight, or? No, not at all. No, we, we don't really do those shows often. We did, one in, we did one in a nice old theatre in London, which was about 600, and it was good, but because it's London, they still, <coughs> even with our gear and the way we do it, they still want to put a barrier up. And they have the press thing. And it's sort of like, it starts getting, uh, uh, I don't know, a bit depressing. Yeah, it's not the real thing. You were saying something about shows how they used to be. Mm. And I think that the fact that it's a seated audience is quite relevant yeah. to looking at the footages of oh, 66, yeah. 67 yeah. shows where especially rather big-ish venues, let's say 400, 600, yeah. why not 800, yeah. where bands that were getting bigger and bigger yeah. were still using the same gear on stage yeah. with limited power yeah. and therefore more saturation on stage, yeah. which was the case tonight. And amps getting slightly thicker as yeah. you were playing the end of the set was rather way noisier yeah. and it was a very strong. And I think this idea of how it used to be is especially relevant yeah, we're in yeah. this very place, which has not always been the case. I've seen it shows where it was quite weird to be here. Yeah. I've, and it fits the weirdest people the best. I've seen Ben Rollers, the best from Country Teasers. Right, um, yeah. Here, and yeah. it was kind of the same relationship, whereas it's really yeah. But it's, it's also quite difficult here because it's uh, because it's a modern theatre, and they have a lot of dampening. Yeah. So what happens is you don't, we don't get any sound coming back either. Yeah. Whereas you see, if, we, if this was a, a Victorian theatre with less uh, dampening, projection. there'd be everything. Would, the sound would be much easier because yeah. everything's being sucked into the walls. But it, yeah, it, but I like I like this sort of. Um, seated venues and things and I mean even if you see it's really funny if you see footage of Woodstock which is quite late on really the music is already fucked basically but if you you see that footage of Hendrix doing um, 
uh, playing Star Spangled Banner. And in part of that footage, the, the camera wanders slightly to the left, and it's just empty, there's no one. And then over here is people standing. So again, people are just standing and watching. Or if you see Monterey, people are just all sat in their chairs listening. And pe what happened was, I think, that in those periods, a lot of the people who were interested in music were um, not were genuine, the people who were genuinely interested and used to go along. It wasn't so much a, um, uh, a cool thing. You know, when I was first involved in punk rock in 77, you didn't get anybody going to the shows who was pretending to like punk rock music. Because I saw every major punk rock group in 77. You couldn't buy tickets in advance, and none of the venues were ever full. You know, there weren't that many people. Because, uh, the, you'd, and if you saw someone who looked like they were into cool music, they were because they didn't want to get beaten up for pretending to be. So when, although you got this negative side of this tribalism of it, it also made it quite good because it meant if someone looked for they were. And it was sort of like, yeah, and it was not this, uh, there wasn't this great revolution going on, it was really sort of like a few people who bothered going. You were telling something about Malcolm McLaren lies and everybody bought that lies and that square. Yeah. I don't agree with it. No, no, that's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Someone say that uh, punk rock happened in, in the UK because in every little town there was fucked up kids were fans of Oakley. Yeah. Well, well certainly the damned were. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Croydon, first of all. Yeah. Uh, I think they were the other ones in name being Captain Sensible. Right? Probably. And they used to go, go, go to the gigs and they thought you were such an idiot, they called you a freak. Uh, what, what, were you, what were you listening before Punk Up? I was listening to... How oh, old are you and how was your... I was, I was, I was 16, 17, yeah. in 77, 76, 77. Mm -hmm. I was listening to the Beatles Live at Hollywood Bowl, early Rolling Stones, Walk Around the... Um, Bill Haley and the Comets. Mm -hmm. um, I used to go to rock and roll revival shows, which weren't very good. And then I was listening to Buddy Holly and early, yeah, that type of thing. So, and I was, that was the sort of music I've been brought up on. And I didn't, because I was weird, because I didn't like rock music much. In the 60s, I listened to Stone, when I was three, four, five, we had Rolling Stones, Beatles, Kinks. And then when I was six or seven, it was Jimi Hendrix, my older brother. And then I didn't like 70s music. So okay. what I listened to was 60s and 50s music. And then when punk rock happened, I liked that for six months. And what I mean when <coughs> I say that people bought into it was that like, uh, I think that you might have misunderstood me like, because Bernie Rhodes and uh, Malcolm were sort of like saying about this punk rock movement and projecting this idea and we're, us in the suburbs around we sort of like, thought oh yeah this is this is true so we'll do it whereas obviously they were really aiming to make big famous groups but they were talking about small groups in the revolution and in the suburbs we sort of like thought oh, that's a good idea we'll do that so that's what i mean is that it sort of like accidentally happened somewhere else that was my that's just my idea but certainly, like um, the groups I played, in, like the Pop Rivets, I was the only one into that music in the Pop Rivets, really. They were all into uh, Lou Reed, Led Zeppelin, and all of these things. Well, and and probably Hawk Quinn and those things, all the other members of the group. Who actually just don't. Uh, the only reason I was in the punk rock group is because I was one of the only people in the town who dressed as a punk rocker. And they said, Do you want to sing in a group? I had no qualification, no ability. Yeah. Would you like to add something for tonight? Who, me? Yeah. Well, I did quite a lot. I have a question for yourself. <laughs> no, well, no question for myself apart from why. I don't know, like, no, if someone has a question and finishes it off, that's good, but I haven't got anything else to say. There's a lady there. Yeah, about lunch, Ben, and 
uh, bands being true to themselves and do you have one memory of a gig which sticks to you to this day and you say when you think about it you're like that's what made me want to do this that's a good question I a lot of the times things are mis like it comes down to a misunderstanding in a way because like I think probably one of the big, biggest influences on me would have been Sex Pistols and they're one of the groups that I don't like. <laughs> but the thing that really sort of like, I, you know, maybe, and strangely watching the Beatles when I was three or four years miming, on, and they were miming on, they said, oh, they're not playing live on this when they're miming. I thought, that's great, that means anyone could do it. So the Beatles in 63, 64. Miming. Yeah, miming. <laughs> exactly, because then you could pretend to do it in a mirror. I had a beat, you know, we used to pretend to play. So it's so, like, but the thing is, at least you felt included somehow, because if you could buy a Beatles week and I had a Beatles guitar, toy guitar, and it was something that sort of like brought you in. And probably, one of the things I really like is Hendrix at Monterey. And I always thought that was like, yeah, probably Jimi Hendrix is the thing that I, you know, young Jimi Hendrix doing uh, early experience stuff. I found really sort of like uh, life affirming. And um, there's a few things like that. Maybe early, seeing The Clash early on. I think Joe Strummer in The Clash very early on when they were a rock and roll band. I think it's really, you know, something sort of like comes up through the floor and you can see that maybe you see early Bo Diddley or early, like, so what I like is when I see groups I don't like, like Ike and Tina Turner. And you see Ike and Tina Turner early on, and it's just so true and real. And, you know, I don't own an Ike and Tina Turner record, and I don't want one. But you see them on the Tammy show or so in 64, 65, 66, that type of thing, for Bo Diddley early on. And it's just like... Uh, it's got this um, heart and soul to it. Or Sun House, if you see Sun House, blues, you know, or muddy waters and things. And it sort of like just seems like, uh, it's, I don't know, it's a very nice feeling. You know, it feels, uh, it's, re it's really satisfying to see uh, hu humans sort of like connecting so deeply with, uh, or join in the creation of things. Or look, you know, same things looking at good Delacroix painting or Van Gogh, you know, that sort of real heart. And I suppose that, I talk to my son, he's not, he's here somewhere, but I think he's in the auditorium. And I sort of say, he, he's at art school and he wants to meet artists and he plays in a group and he wants to meet these people. And I said, these good people you want aren't necessarily gonna be born and be around when you are but they have been born and they have lived at different times and you can connect with that through them. You have got friends like Dostoevsky or, you know, or Knut Hansen or Van Gogh or Delacroix who, who are real human beings who really felt something and it connects across any age. And uh, it means that you've got friends that you, it, yeah, they're friends that you haven't got. So, I, I see it lots of times, but contemporary, not greatly, you know. But I don't. I think that's a big ask because I don't think probably many people come along or around or that you necessarily run into them that often. Is yeah. there any 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 people that you've been playing stages with uh, when you started that you feel are? were your contemporaries yeah, and, so it's my and were still there and still approach it and still yeah, I still, yeah I, still, I do see people who I think do it. Yeah, there's um, a friend of mine, Neil, uh, Neil Palmer, who sings in the Spartan Dregs, who was in a group called the Fire Department. And I was just talking to that fellow Steve from Stephen the Jerks, who was here, who's asking if we play ever. And that, you know, that sort of like, um, 
I, I, I know one or two people who I think are really, really properly great and that nobody else does. But I know that they, you know, and they're not necessarily always in contact with it or always able to produce it, but they've been there and, you've, you know, I've, I've witnessed it. I think they're humans. Humans can do it. And it does. It does happen. Shush, Wall. <laughs> maybe he's got a question. I think we're done. Good. Okay. Thank what you do doing? I don't know. <laughs> Waiting to be rescued. I didn't know you were still in here. I'm oh, putting in here because I'm trying to maybe do it out there Sorry, and make sure it's going thin. Oh, just been losing my voice talking nonsense. All right, well, can we, can we start now? Yes, it's finished. Good. Does somebody want you to sign this? That's what it would be. up. Just sign it. <laughs> Merci à tous. Thank you.